Welcome everyone to my talk about uh, asking for help and thanks, thanks for sticking here for the last day afternoon. Uh, my name is Jakub Scholz. I work as an engineer at uh, Red Hat and I'm also a maintainer of the community which is called Streamzy, which is Cloud Native Computing Foundation project which is about running Apache Kafka on, on Kubernetes. Uh, and I guess as, uh, as many of us, I kind of have the experience uh, with asking from, for help from, from both sides. On the Streamzy part, I'm often the go-to guy who has all the answers. But then, for example, in the Kafka community or in the Kubernetes community, I'm the one asking others for help. And uh, I kind of see a lot of inefficiencies in uh, how this works usually. So that's why I kind of decided to give a try with this talk to improve it a bit. So, I think that helping others is kind of one of the most common parts of the open source community life, right? Uh, it's quite normal that there are people who come and ask whether some feature is supported. There are people who ask about how to use some feature, how to implement something, how to architecture something. And there are, of course, also many people who come they already run the project in production and then suddenly run into some issues. They don't know how to solve it. And they come screaming, help, help, my production is down. Uh, so these are just some examples of uh, how people might be asking for help in the different communities uh, we work in. And in general, this is an important part of the community life and of the community process, right? Because uh, it obviously helps us get new users it helps us onboard the users and kind of make them from people interested in the project into the users of the project. But it also facilitates feedback. When we see that a lot of people are asking about some features, then maybe if we don't have the feature, then maybe this is something what the people are interested in and we should consider adding support for it. Or if it's feature which we have support for, but a lot of people are asking about it, then uh, yeah, maybe our documentation or maybe the way it's implemented, the usability is not really good enough. So, uh, so that's another kind of feedback. And finally, if someone has some problem somewhere in production, then maybe that's some bug somewhere which should be fixed. So this is kind of a big part of that. And another part is that when people ask about something in some forum, then usually that's kind of safe, that's archived and it's searchable. So it serves also as a kind of knowledge base and as a, as a material for further learning. So other people might then see the questions, they might read the answers and see, oh, this is something I didn't know about. And uh, this is really something that's not unique to open source communities because that happens everywhere, right? Colleagues are asking for help or if you have paid support for some software then you might be asking some support hotline for help. What makes this a bit unique for open source communities is that a lot of this happens on a voluntary basis, right? Even uh, at Red Hat, when uh, many of us are basically paid to work in the open source communities, there's still a lot of time which we spend there over the weekends or evenings trying to answer some questions, which is not really paid, right? So really a lot of this is for free and voluntary, and this makes it a bit special and that's why is one of the reasons why I think we should kind of try to make sure that this is as efficient as possible and doesn't consume time, which it doesn't need to. Uh, so how does this consume the time or how can this be inefficient? If people ask the questions in the wrong way, then maybe there will be several loops and several iterations where someone has to kind of okay, you said this, but can you please share the configuration? Can you please share the lock and so on? And all of this takes time. And in between that, people need to kind of switch focus. So maybe they were working on writing some code. Now someone asked the question, so they have to switch the focus, try to answer something and, and so on. So, so that can be uh, quite inefficient. And I believe that improving this and making this as efficient as possible is kind of a win-win situation for, for both sides. Because if you look at what the users typically want, then uh, yeah, sure, if they ask for some help in any form, they usually want to get the help as quickly as possible. 
If it's some production issue, then it's maybe super urgent. If they are just asking about some feature, maybe they don't care whether the answer is in one hour or in one day. But yeah, they usually want to get these answers. But at the same time, they want probably the software, the project to get bug fixes. They also want the project to get some new features, right? Because if you are using some, some kind of project, some software, or if you are planning to use it, you don't really want to start using something that will not get any bug fixes for the next six months because everyone from the community is busy answering questions, right? So it's in their interest that the, the kind of answering the question and answering, providing the help doesn't consume all the time, but that there is time for other things as well to keep the project alive. And similarly, if you are some kind of committer in the project, then uh, of course, you are interested in helping your users, right? One of the reasons why we are doing this is that we want to have users. We want to have usually as many users as possible. So yeah, we want to provide the help. Uh, and we want the users in general to be quite happy. So yeah, sure. But at the same time, a lot of the people in the, in the community, the committers, they don't really want to spend all their time just answering some questions, right? Some of them might prefer to write code most of the time. Some of them maybe want to do some testing. Some of them want to write docs or, or do some other parts of the community work. But not everyone wants to just spend the time answering, 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 answering some questions in some forum. So, so they also want this process to be as efficient as possible. So that's a win-win for, for everyone. Now, how can you improve it? Uh, and I believe that the right way or easiest way how to improve it is by asking the questions in the right way. And actually, that means that maybe if possible, you should try not to ask the question at all and you should first try to help yourself. That means that, for example, you can uh, try to Google the question and try to get the answer from Google, right? Uh, but it can also mean that you should use the documentation. Most projects have some documentation. People invested usually quite a lot of effort into writing the documentation. So uh, please try to use it. And uh, don't worry, it doesn't mean that you have to spend hours and hours reading uh, hundreds of pages of some documentation. Most projects have this kind of single page version of the documentation, so you can just open it, press the magical Control F button, and then try to search in it, right? And maybe you find the answer, maybe you don't, but you at least tried. And if you tried and it didn't help, I think it's great to kind of mention it in the next step when you actually ask the question. Because A, let's be pragmatic. Uh, if the people trying to help you see that you actually tried to help yourself first and you tried to do something on your own, it will be kind of a bonus point for you, right? Uh, but there's also more pragmatic part about it. Uh, and that's that when you, for example, start a question, I'm looking for, for this and I searched in the documentation for this term, it again provides a feedback to the project, right? Maybe the documentation calls this feature with one term and it turns out all people are coming and searching for a completely different term. So the community can kind of go and change the documentation to do some rewording and use the other terms there as well to make it easier to find for the, for the next users. Uh, it wouldn't be a 2023 talk without mentioning ChatGPT, right? Uh, so I actually see it used from time to time by our users uh, to kind of ask the question to ChatGPT instead of the community. My experience with it is very mixed. It sometimes gives very good answer, but sometimes it makes up some complete nonsense. Uh, in any case, it's always absolutely super confident that it's 100% correct and it is answering the absolutely right thing, right? So, yeah, maybe that's, that's an option. Uh, maybe not. Uh, maybe it will get better in the future. One thing which this definitely doesn't do is that the community doesn't really know what you were asking to the chat GPT. So, so all this kind of feedback loop, knowing what features are people interested in, what problems they are running in, that's kind of lost because it will be only chat GPT who will know about these things and the community will not see it in some, some Slack channel. Okay, so you try to help yourself first, but didn't find the answer. So you have to ask, right? So the first thing to start with 
is finding the right place. Because there are quite often many different places where we can ask. There are mailing lists, there's stack overflow, there are GitHub issues, uh, there's Slacks, Discords, GitHub discussions, LinkedIn, all these different places. Some people try to ask for help even with DMs on Twitter, for example. Uh, but there's always many options. Uh, and you should try to find the right place. Uh, and that can depend on several different things. First of all is, what is the community actually using? And it's quite common that in the readme file, in the GitHub repo, for example, most communities kind of have some section which is like ask for help or discussions and mailing lists and so on. So you can kind of find that and check the information there, which is about uh, whether they are using Slack or something else, whether they are using some mailing list. And all these things are often there. You should also think a bit about uh, what type of question you are asking and how suited it is uh, to, the, to the place where you are going to ask it. So, for example, Stack Overflow is a great place. Wu from us didn't use it for at least something, right? But it's kind of well suited for a specific kinds of questions. If you, for example, want to ask whether some feature is supported or for something fairly simple with fairly clear answers, it works well. But if you have a production problem where kind of analyzing it and debugging it ends up in a huge chain of questions, answers, logs being shared, it doesn't really work that well because the, the lengths of the posts are very limited. You can't really attach easily logs to it and it doesn't have really that well integrated kind of the, the flow for the questions and answers. So, for that, Stack Overflow might not be the best option. Maybe some GitHub discussion where you can easily attach things or some Slack might be much better option. And obviously, a little bit, it also depends on your preferences. Some people simply prefer to send the email and then read the answers next day. Some people prefer more real-time communication and then they would, for example, go for Slack where they can kind of get questions and answers in a more conversation style. Uh, Something to think about is also whether you really want to ask the same question on five different places. There are people who go and ask the same question on Stack Overflow, Slack, GitHub issues, GitHub discussions, mailing list, and all of that within two minutes, right? What is the expectation from the people in the community to handle this? Do you really expect them to kind of prepare the answer and copy paste it into all these different places? Or do you expect uh, that kind of someone will reply here, someone will reply there, and you get kind of like a second opinion like with some doctor? Or will they reply just in one place and all the other places will remain unanswered, but probably searched by the index, by the search engines, and then popping up in the search queries? So yeah, really think about whether this is the right approach and whether it isn't better to ask in one place and then give it some time for the answers before asking somewhere else. And uh, it's also important to ask in the right community. Like I have here some friends from the Debezium community and a lot of Debezium users use Debezium with the Strimzy project which I'm working on. And in our community we get a lot of questions about the Debezium project and we don't know really how to answer them and there's not fully many people who know how to answer it in our community because it's not really our software, it's more this other project. So by finding the right project, uh, you can also save people's time because you ask it in the right place and also it much improves the chances that you get the answer because if you ask in the place where the people have the answers for your question, then you can actually get the answer, right? Uh, of course, sometimes it's quite hard to kind of know the boundary, know which project you are actually asking about. So it's not possible to do this always perfectly, but you should at least try. Uh, another thing is that you should share as much as possible. You should share what versions are you using, you should share the configurations, you should share the logs, you should share the steps, how to reproduce it, you should share what you actually expect it to happen, you should share how the environment looks like, and all these things right away. I have two examples of questions which I see very often in our community, and uh, you might not understand the details if you don't know Apache Kafka, but I ho they hopefully give kind of the idea of, of the wrong type of question. So this one is, my Kafka producer fails with following error, not authorized to produce messages to topic, my topic. 
Anyone has idea what the problem might be? And I have the idea right away, right? The problem is that the producer is not authorized to produce messages to topic my topic. And if you look at the questions like this, then that's pretty much the only answer you can give to it. Now, typically this represents some bigger issue. The person asking this might not know how to use the authorization, might not know kind of the right way how to use the authorization. They may have misconfigured something or there might be some bug, right? But without kind of having all the other informations, it's basically impossible to say the right answer. So how this will end up is that uh, someone will come and ask for more details, ask for the logs, ask for the configurations. And it's again, it's all these kind of empty cycles which just waste time and don't add anything real. Here is a similar question. Uh, my Kafka consumer is not receiving any messages, and this is what I see in my logs, and then single randomly picked line which the person thinks is actually the problem, right? Uh, and you might know Kafka, but I know Kafka, and trust me, this is not the problem. This is just a regular info message. Uh, so when you are asking questions like this, you obviously don't know the answer. So you should not assume that you know exactly which line from the log will lead to the answer, right? So sharing the full log, sharing the configuration, again, can be super helpful to actually find out what the issue is. And this is, again, another question which I see very often, but which will basically just follow up with some interrogation about sharing more information and more details. So yeah, if you ask the question, make sure to read what you are actually sharing and think whether kind of some magical answer can be provided based on that or not. And uh, you should not assume if you don't know the answer that you know what will lead to the answer. So you should really try to share everything, what you can, all the configurations, logs. But you should also try to share the kind of uh, more soft things, like what were the steps you were doing when this problem happened to you? Or what were actually your expectations to happen? Because sometimes people just do something and something happens. They think it's wrong, but it's actually the thing which others expected to happen and which is there for some reason. Uh, many of the projects use issue templates on GitHub, which kind of can give you hints for what might be the points which you should share. Like typically there might be some kind of form with questions, what version are you using, how you installed it, on what Kubernetes version, for example, are you using it, and so on. So you can use this often as a guidance at what might be the important information you should share right away. And then, uh, a lot of projects have also some kind of troubleshooting tool which uh, generates a report for you and kind of collects all this information. So you can check that out as well and if they have it, then you can kind of use this to easily collect all the important <coughs> information. So share as much as possible and uh, what's also important is using the right format. Uh, probably mm, several of us at least here use quite often Kubernetes and use YAMLs and what's special about that is that the white spaces in the YAML document are super important. And if you just copy paste some YAML into some GitHub issue without proper formatting, then it doesn't show the white spaces and it's basically unreadable and nobody who sees it, it's hard to read, but nobody can even say whether the indentation is correct or not, whether the YAML is correct. So, so formatting it to making it readable is super important and Ideally, you should also think such as logs, try to share them as a file so that can, they can be searchable or, or uh, that ca they can be easily read on devices such as smartphones or tablets uh, instead of, for example, making a screenshot of your whole screen, ideally with a phone instead of using some print screen tool and then sharing that. Uh, so you should share as much as possible, but you should try to keep the secret, right? So one of the dangers with sharing everything is that quite often you share things which are confidential, which should not be shared. And some of these things are quite obvious, like you shouldn't share any passwords, you shouldn't share any TLS certificates and private keys and stuff like that. Uh, so you can kind of try to look for these obvious things, but there's kind of a bit more to that, right? Different organizations might have different rules for what they consider as a confidential. So in some cases, you might be actually not even allowed to ask a question in some open source community with your company email because they don't want everyone to know that they are using this project and that they have some problem or question. Uh, in many cases, 
IP addresses or host names will be considered confidential by most organizations as well. And, uh, and so on. So it's good to understand based on your organization what you can actually share and what's not allowed to share and what you might maybe uh, anonymize. And sometimes there's no other way how to do that than uh, go through the logs, anonymize it, replace all the places. But keep in mind that details matter and that you should use, for example, if you are replacing IP addresses, you should always use different placeholder. You should not just flat out replace every IP address with some IP placeholder. You should, for example, use IP1 for one IP address, IP2 for the next one, and so on, so that it can still possible to see from the logs who communicated with whom and, and things like that. Uh, a lot of people try to work around these limitations by saying, oh, hey, I will send you the log in a direct message on Slack, for example, to do it privately, to not share the logs publicly. Now, first thing to consider is whether the community really wants to do this and whether the people trying to help you really want to do this. So, for example, when it comes to me, I'm not really doing the community support as a, as a private support for individual persons on direct messages. But other people might be fine with it. But you should still consider some other aspects even if the people are fine with it. First of all, the, the question and the kind of discussion will be not really useful for any kind of learning or as a, any kind of knowledge base because uh, if you have some discussion, then some log shared somewhere else and then the discussion continues, you don't really know what was in the log. So if you are trying to solve something about seemingly the same problem, but the lock is missing. You don't know, is it really applicable to me? Is it not? And, uh, and so on. But also, maybe a bit more important, are you actually allowed to share this thing with some random person on the internet uh, through a direct message? And usually the answer will be no. In the same way as you are not allowed to share the locks with the IP addresses and so on in some public channel, you will probably not be allowed to send it to some random person on uh, the internet just because he works on some open source community project. The, the person will have no non-disclosure agreement or anything like that. You don't know how is his computer secured. Maybe he downloads it there and the next day someone hacks him or maybe it's just his uh, son using the computer at that time and so on. So, so you should really consider whether this is actually something you should do in the first place or not. Uh, Okay, one thing, one other thing to talk about is kind of this language barrier. Who have you seen these four, four characters? W, D, Y, M. Raise your hand. Nobody saw them? Yeah. Most of you probably know what that means. So this W, D, Y, M stands for what do you mean? And so this title basically says, what do you mean with what do you mean, right? And it's actually kind of something what I was asked by a user in our community. Uh, but it's often the situation that in our teams, in our kind of daily communication, we are quite used to use these acronyms. What do you mean? As far as I know, thank you, if I remember correctly, uh, for your information and so on. But other people might not really know what do these mean and might not understand them. So one of the things you can do is uh, you can try to avoid them and you can try to write them in a full word because that will be more understandable to, to everyone on the internet. Uh, it's obviously using shortcuts and acronyms is not the, not the only problem which comes with regards to the language. Uh, the, I'm afraid the only help which I have with regards to the language is that, again, if you share the things, if you stick to the things such as the locks, the commands, the configurations, these things are usually not translated. Right? So if you have some kubectl command or if you have some Linux shell commands or things like that, they are usually always the same in Czech, in English, and probably in most other languages as well. The same applies for log, like maybe you will have in different language the kind of error info and so on translated, but the messages issued by the applications, they are often always in English. So you can kind of use these and share these 
and they really help to understand the issues because that's something what you can read. And, and from my own experience, you can quite often answer a question which is, for example, written in Chinese without knowing anything about Chinese. But you, for example, see the commands, you see the lock and the configuration, you know, oh, this is probably this problem which someone else had before, right? And just from kind of these well-known things, you can figure it out. Uh, uh, one other thing I would add is that a lot of the people answering the questions on trying to help you, they might not have bad intentions. They are just probably used to use the language differently with their colleagues. They might not be always able to easily kind of switch to a different mode and use a simple language when answering. So don't be afraid to, to ask something to be repeated or maybe to be repeated in some easier language or don't be afraid to kind of try to rephrase your question if you think it was not understood. Usually the people are, are kind of uh, fine with uh, people who maybe don't have such a great language skills as they do and they will try to do their best it's just sometimes that they need to kind of realize that they should do this. Uh, another advice is to be, to be patient uh, and give the community some time to actually get back to you, to answer it. This is often different person by person. Some people don't like to kind of the switching context between different things. And for example, at the end of the day, have one hour spare for answering questions on some Slack channels and answering emails and so on. So sometimes you have to wait for them to kind of get into this time which they have scheduled for this and then they will reply. For smaller projects, it's also quite common that for example, all the people working on them are in, in North America or in Europe or in Asia and they don't really cover all the different time zones. So if you live in the wrong time zone, so to say, and uh, ask the question at the wrong time. Everyone might be maybe sleeping and they reply only when they wake up. So, so be patient, but you should also be aware that just because nobody answered doesn't mean that nobody cares about your question or that nobody saw your question. It can also happen that just nobody knows the answer and they just don't know what to reply. The last thing I would like to mention is that you should also try to give back to the communities when asking for, for help. Uh, because, yeah, let's be realistic, people always tend to help more to their friends and people they know than someone who's completely strange for, to them, right? And you don't really need to spend weeks contributing some, some software patches or new features to the project. You can do several simple things. If you already know something about the project, you can, for example, try to help others who have some simple questions. Right? And then when you ask something yourself, the people will know, oh, this is the person who was answering all these questions, let's help him now. Similarly, a lot of the open source projects have some kind of adopters list or some, set, uh, some kind of website with the logos of the users. Uh, and uh, again, you can quite easily open a PR to add your organization to that list. And then when you need some help, then the rest of the community will know, oh, this is the person from this organization. We have their logo on the website. They are our users. Let's try to make sure that uh, yeah, it works for them and let's try to fix their production issue, for example. So, so these are kind of some things which you can do very easily and which can kind of help to give back to the community. And that's it. Hope this was at least a little bit useful. And uh, I think we should have a few minutes for questions. So, yeah. so the question was that sometimes you try to help someone and you maybe help them successfully and then they start to kind of ask you more and more questions and they start to kind of use you as a personal search engine, personal Wikipedia and, uh, and kind of ask at any time of the day and so on. So how you can kind of try to do, deal with this in a, in a polite way. 
I hope I captured it correctly. Yeah. So I think uh, that's not easy. And to be honest, I'm maybe not the right person to ask about doing things in the polite way. Uh, so I think one thing which I do often is, as I said, if someone tries to DM me, for example, on Slack with questions, I usually tell them you should ask this in the in the channel shared with everyone and not ask this on the DMs. Uh, Often people simply just kind of CC you on Slack personally instead of just asking everyone in the community. And then you get notifications and then other people might feel like that's specially for you and they should not reply. So again, I try to kind of politely say, please don't do this. Don't kind of mention people in random questions if there is no real connection to the person and uh, ask really just the community. And to be honest, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I had a person who, when I told them to kind of, that something is documented, that they should look there for details, they told me that they will not look into documentation because asking uh, and getting answer from someone else is much easier. So uh, yeah, sometimes it's hard to answer politely and, uh, and kind of solve this in a polite way. Yeah. Just a reply. I think in many communities, mostly open source, most of the people there are often volunteers. They are doing many of that work in their spare time. Even, for example, me, I'm employed by Red Hat, but I also do some things on top of that in my spare time. And it is important. Maybe to just try to rephrase what was said in the discussion from Publicum, that it's important to kind of try to keep your time and your own energy under control and kind of try to make the people to understand that something is, for example, done voluntarily and they cannot expect the same reply times and kind of handling as uh, in some paid support, for example, and, and so on. Does that somehow capture it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's completely fine to simply explain that yeah, you don't have time, that this is a voluntary based support. I one of the things you can also do is kind of you can try to take more and more time to reply, which kind of instead of replying every time in 10 seconds, then if you reply in few hours next time and then in few days next time, sometimes kind of you undo the, the, the thing that you are always being asked. Uh, you had a question? So the question was, uh, if, if someone asks a question in a wrong channel, whether the, the kind of question can be somehow easily transferred or something like that? Uh, yeah, so, so to be honest, uh, I, it depends a bit on where you ask. Like, I don't think you can move the uh, messages between channels on Slack that easily, for example. You can just reshare them in some other channel. Uh, on, on GitHub, for example, if someone opens a bug instead of opening a GitHub discussion, you can normally use GitHub functionality to kind of transfer the issue into a discussion. So it a bit depends on the, on the platform. Uh, what, what I kind of try when, I, when someone does it on, 
kind of if someone does, doesn't ask the wrong question 10 times per day, they, I kind of try to tell them, look, this might not be the right community. There might not be that many people who will have the answer for you. Maybe you should try to ask uh, in the right community. So, so like, I usually try to kind of direct them, but yeah, again, that's something what costs time and sometimes until someone gets to that, it might take a long time, but I, I don't, I'm afraid there's no better and easier solution. Uh, anyone else? Jakub? So the question is basically whether some community communication guidelines might help to kind of reduce these things. I, to be honest, I didn't try that, so I don't have a, a real answer from the experience. I think it might be interesting thing to try, and it might make it kind of easier to kind of point to these guidelines. Uh, but at the same time, I like I hope talks like this would help to convince the people to first start looking into things like documentation. So I'm not really sure I would expect people to first read some communication guidelines before asking these questions. So, so like I think they can make it easier to reply, but they might not make it easy to kind of avoid the questions in the first place. Yeah, I, I think that's it's interesting idea which might be worth trying here. Anyone has any other question? Yeah. So the question was whether there is some tool or some service which would uh, kind of automatically hide the things such as IPs. Uh, and to be honest, I don't know about any. Like in the Streamzy project, for example, we have this kind of report tool which collects the information. So we make sure that we don't kind of copy there the passwords and the certificates. But we, for example, don't mask any IPs there or anything like that, and I'm not sure about I'm not aware of any other tools which would be doing that. Okay, I, we are out of time, so thanks a lot for, uh, for staying here and for watching. I hope it was useful for you. <laughs>